the left and right come together for fundamental truths. AD on the radio. Today is Wednesday, the 20th of April, 420, a day that is celebrated by pretty much everyone I know except me. I don't know. I'm not interested. I, I don't partake. I never have. I don't smoke anything. Well, to say I never have is not true. I mean, uh, from the ages of about 15 to 18, um, I, I enjoyed the occasional the 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 occasional toke on something but i don't know it always shot my brain off into like eight million different directions a lot of people find that they get clarity and they can do something and they can take massive bong rips and go be productive i was never one of those guys but i 100 million percent support the legalization of marijuana and you know what i should be the person i should be the person advocating for this someone who has absolutely no interest in smoking it and there's all sorts of good reasons there's all sorts of good reasons uh, why marijuana should be legalized, and we could do entire shows on that. We're not going to uh, take too much of today's time uh, doing it. We will talk about some of them, though, right after we hear from the Meister himself on the subject matter, Tommy Chong. If everybody was stoned, there'd be less violence in the world, man. Because you know? they've done studies, and they found that you can't hurt anybody if you can't find your car keys. You know? <laughs> When you get stoned on a pot, man, you walk around the house all day with the keys in one hand. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and they talk about pot being a gateway drug. It's more of a doorway drug. <laughs> as soon as you walk through that doorway, you can't remember what the f*** you're looking for. You know? <laughs> what am I doing in the closet? <laughs> Why am I holding my keys? That's why I keep a bong in every room of my house. <laughs> then you go, oh, a bong. Okay, I know what to do now. <laughs> so, yeah, it's 420 day. Happy 420. Or, you know, as Snoop Dogg calls it, Wednesday. Or as Funyuns call it, the Holocaust. I, I don't celebrate 420, not in the traditional way. It it's not my thing. But one thing that I really find very interesting about April 20th, 420, or just the time 420. After talking to some of my friends that celebrate it with a borderline religious fervor, one thing I find very interesting is the fact that right around 5 o'clock on the 20th of April, some very, very creative and oftentimes delicious recipe ideas are born. So if you have, if you have any that uh, you came up with whilst celebrating the holiday based around a certain combustible plant that will alter your mood. Well, then, I'd be really interested to hear that. At ADSXE is where you can tweet me or AD at iHeartMedia.com. I am uh, joined on the show today by producer Dave Hines, who is filling in for Funkhauser while Funkhauser is off at the National Association of Broadcasters, showing off the fact that he has a girlfriend yes. and most of the other people there do not. But, Dave, <laughs> do you... Uh, Without uh, wanting to expose too much of uh, how you like to go through the, your life in this world... <laughs> Uh, do I partake? Uh, is that what you're asking? Well, you know, you're in California. Uh, it I can am. be medicinal. I am, and I do have my medical card, and uh -huh. um, I do. Now, my story's much different. I never really touched this stuff until I was, well, first off, I was out of the military. Uh -huh. uh, so I was like 33 before I, uh, ever, okay. before I ever partook. And I think that makes it a lot different for me than a lot of other people. Hmm. Just I feel like my relationship with it has been more of an adult as this is something that you could really go overboard with. So don't do that. Mm. 
Um, so let me ask you this. What was it at age 33 that led you to go? And was was the first time you ever thought, I'm going to give this stuff a go? A lot of people seem to enjoy the tobacco that is, in fact, wacky. Mm-hmm. But let's, uh, let's blaze one up um, at, at age 33. What was it that made you decide to do that? And it being uh, L.A., I, I don't know how long ago you were 33, but was there medicinal marijuana at the time? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was yeah. only – I'm 37, so it, okay. it wasn't that long ago. Um and yeah, I think curiosity was part of it. Um, I had some pain issues and uh, like some a couple of things that just I had heard and talked to other people who had suffered from those same uh, problems that this might be a, a better way to yeah. uh, to deal with that. And so I thought I'd give it a try, and uh, it worked. And hmm. it's been it's been something that's been interesting. Uh, well, I have all sorts of questions about what it's like to be a medicinal marijuana user, which we will get to <laughs> a little after this. Happy 420, everybody. Like most kids from a privileged white upper middle class suburban background, for a significant portion of his childhood, he was pretty convinced he was down. Hey D, on the radio. If you do celebrate 420, I have a question for you. And maybe you celebrate 420 on a daily basis. Maybe you celebrate it just once a year. But I have found that by talking to some of my friends that do, in fact, partake, I have gleaned some interesting, creative, and oftentimes delicious recipe ideas from them right around eh, 445 in the afternoon. (laughs) That's when the uh, creative chef juices get going and a certain amount of kitchen improvisation tends to happen, I find, with my friends that do that sort of thing. Dave Hines is a medicinal marijuana user who didn't start until he was 33. He had some pain. Uh, He had a couple of other things that he thought it might benefit. And as it turns out, in the state of California, where medicinal marijuana was uh, readily available, he he took a chance, and it did. It helped him. But um, l- let me ask you this. Have you come up with anything interesting and delicious whilst uh, enjoying your medicine? Oh, of, <laughs> of course. Um, I think one of the things that's interesting is that the medicine or whatever, you know, it is just kind of fun to take. But I also don't completely, like, I, I don't think, I'm definitely not an activist. So, I don't know. As far as the recipes go, though, Yeah. I mean, I'll come up with some interesting things from time to time, but I'm not one of those people who just uh, who just starts mowing through food. I usually have <laughs> something else going. I, I write a lot more songs that way. Uh-huh. I, mm-hmm. I I don't only write songs like that, but sometimes it it happens and it's fun. You know, see when, like when writing I was songs uh, anyway. When I was a guy in a band. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, there, there was a there was a brief overlap of me smoking pot and being in a band. And during that time, I'd heard all sorts of things about like, hey, this can make you more creative. This can uh, this is a lubricant for the artistic process. Mm-hmm. You should give this a go. So um, I uh, I was stuck on something, and I was like, let me give this a try. And I smoked a bowl and uh, went to the studio to try and write something. And I think I came up with exactly what I would have come up with if I'd been stone cold sober. It just took me much. Much longer. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that's definitely that's definitely something. I don't know that it, it, what bothers me is when people look at it as some kind of cure all that could have no potential bad things happen with it. Now it it's has from the earth. It must be good for you. Right. It has way <laughs> fewer side effects than a lot of other things that people use on mm. a regular basis mm-hmm. for recreational or medicine or or whatever. So I, I get that. I don't want to get around, around that, but I think that. Like, uh, what was it Dr. Drew one time said? There's no free passes in nature. So as Mm. long as you pay attention to that, like, you know, used responsibly, a lot of things are okay. And used irresponsibly, a lot of things are horrible things to put into your life. And I think that might be one of those other things, just like said recipes that you come up with at 5 o'clock. You can eat too much food and really cause some problems for yourself. Yeah, no, I suppose it really is like, 
a lot of things, you know, it, it, like drinking, gambling, mm-hmm. anything that could be considered yeah. to be a vice. And in moderation, that's fine. But if you get to the point where it starts to cost you things in, in your life, in your personal life, financially, physically, maybe, uh, that's where literally anything yeah. can become a problem. You know, you get thrown out of a moving car <laughs> by mm-hmm. loan sharks like an uncle of mine did once. Wow. Um, that, uh, that's a pretty good indicator that you have a gambling problem. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's causing you grievous bodily harm. You should probably do something about that. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know. I like. I, I'm straight edge, just old school punk rock thing. I don't smoke. Don't take drugs. Don't right. believe in casual sex. Don't do a lot of things that a lot of people consider to be a lot of fun. A lot of people would tell me that the fact that I drink about eight gallons of coffee a day negates my uh, high horse that I sit on, but I, I, I don't. For I, I'm not soapboxing or anything. It's just none of that stuff is. I don't want anything in my life that's going to slow me down, and all that stuff would slow me down. But I will say this, though. If I was in a situation where I was given a choice between taking medicinal marijuana in the form of a cookie versus some sort of hillbilly heroin-esque type drug like Oxycontin, um, I, I'm going for the cookie every single time. You know? And the other thing that the other thing about legalizing marijuana, oh, there I am climbing back up onto the soapbox mm-hmm. again, but uh, F it, it's 420. Seems like an apropos day to do this. Look, you know where the expression bought the farm comes from when everything goes horribly wrong that comes from farmers losing everything it's such a precarious existence you are the backbone of america you are the sweat blood and toil upon which america was founded if you are a farmer and you are living in a position where you could lose everything if it gets unusually frosty in april like Mm -hmm. that's where the expression bought the farm comes from and if you look at california who humongous agricultural state the number one cash crop in all of california is ding 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 marijuana and you look at some folks in the midwest that are really really struggling and you think hey wouldn't it be uh wouldn't it be nice if they could maybe just plant themselves a little patch of this and uh oh i don't know make that house payment or not have to uh, not have to lose absolutely everything like mm-hmm. if medicinal marijuana gave us a chance to give back to farmer the what it could do for farmers in america alone would to me justify it i mean look it, it's medicinally legal in a couple of places it's recreationally legal in a couple of places at, at this stage in the game i think we are just impeding the evolution of the species by getting in the way of this and uh, look if you can manage to if you can manage to stop putting people in jail for having a dime bag that mm-hmm. would be great and, yeah you know i mean the alex jones part of me is like well that's what they want the prison industrial complex is a very very big business and independently run businesses or prisons and blah 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 but um yeah i'm all in favor favor of legalization and i have absolutely no interest in it we will feel the 420 burn with an e when we discuss what bernie sanders is going to do with himself after having lost his home city his home state new york we'll get to it next thanks for hanging out tweet us at adsxe what's your what's your handle heinz at, at heinz us 97 <laughs> there you go More AD on the radio. So I guess the question is, I guess the question is, what's Bernie Sanders going to be doing with himself next? We'll have to wait and see how this all plays out. But losing New York to Hillary, uh, that's a kick in the unmentionable, uh, unmentionables for sure. A lot of people said he would never be standing at this stage in the game. And if there's one thing that the last several months have proven in the world of American politics when it comes to pulling the lever for democracy, electing a new president of these United States of America, and indeed leader of the free world... It's that it's a freaking crapshoot. Nobody knows what the hell is up and people predict and people say, well, it's not going to it's not going to be Trump. It's it's not going to it's just not going to be Trump. Hmm. And uh, Trump won't last another week. Trump. Oh, oh, oh. All right. 
all bets are freaking off in this situation. And, well, a lot of people would say, all right, that's it. That is it. Bernie Sanders is done. But people have said that about numerous folks in this election numerous times. So we'll discuss the reality of Bernie Sanders' situation a little later on. I want to share with you my favorite 420 recipe, though, before I forget. I don't even smoke pot and I forget recipes. <laughs> um, well, like this time last year, I interviewed the guys in the band Dirty Heads and uh, they're like, happy 420. I was like, I get the idea that your record label wanted me to interview you on 420 day. But is this really any different for you than any other day of the year? <laughs> He's like, no, you're right. We kind of just smoke pot all the time, but uh, if, if they want to put us on the phone with radio stations, okay, we'll, we'll take it. And it was very, very interesting. And uh, their response to my 420 recipe question was, they were like, hey, we discovered in New York City once when we were baked out of our minds in a pizza parlor that sriracha sauce and honey on a pepperoni pizza is a revelation. And I was like, that's really interesting because that's the new flavor at, uh, at, at Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut had just come out with, like, honey sriracha sauce on their pizzas. And they're like, what? D- really? And I was like, yeah, I think Pizza Hut stole your idea. They're like, we think they stole the idea, too. But you know what? <laughs> They, uh, the Dirty Heads and Pizza Hut have a point. Honey and sriracha on a pepperoni pizza is a revelation. Mm. Years ago, when I was in school, a buddy of mine taught me that if you take the cheapest white bread that you can find and you spread peanut butter on it, preferably crunchy, doesn't have to be, mm-hmm. but at that stage in the game, you kind of get into textures of food. <laughs> You're really crunchy, man. <laughs> but um, if you take... The cheapest white bread you can find. Spread preferably crunchy peanut butter on it. Sprinkle that in cinnamon sugar. Then wad the whole thing up into a ball and put it in the microwave for about 15 seconds. That, my friend, is some culinary winning. And you know what? Like, that's a... If I ever feel like I deserve a little treat, it's been a long day. Hey, Dean needs a treat. (laughs) I will do that to this day. And it's delicious. And you can roll it up like like a little... Wonder Bread crepe as well, and it's mm. awesome. And I, I would give that a go. Um, I would give that a go, especially if you're celebrating 420. Uh, make sure the peanut butter is crunchy, and you will thank me. And even if it's not something that you celebrate, even if you are not, uh, if you're not making with the combustibles this afternoon, well, then uh, I still think that you'll find it to be a delicious snack. Yeah, and a big surprise. <laughs> I do remember the one time I remember being a kid when I, during a very b- brief period in my life where I did smoke pot. And the one very brief time that I remember um, having that, 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 that munchy moment, th- there was nothing else in the fridge. And you know those, like, they're essentially cardboard. They're tasteless. They're uh, supposedly good for you. You know, Rivita? Oh, yeah, yeah. How they like, and they tear up the inside of your mouth because they're just, especially if you, you got to really put them in your mouth care- carefully. Otherwise, they'll like <laughs> rip the sides of your lips to shreds. They're like it's really Japanese throwing stars. Yeah. Yeah. That you eat mm-hmm. <laughs> with, with cheese on them. Um, like I found that one time when I had nothing else in the house, those dipped in mayonnaise um, are an interesting one because the mayonnaise was cool and soothing and uh, mm. <laughs> the Rivita was crunchy and different. I tried that. Unlike the, the, the peanut butter bread cinnamon sugar mm. combination, I tried that when I was not baked and I was not similarly impressed. <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough, double fisting mayonnaise on crackers is, isn't, a, isn't a recipe for anything other than intestinal disaster a little later on. But it sounds I, uh, so I, Canadian. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like right now, there's like, hey, that guy's talking about what we're doing, eh? I, I don't think anyone. Basil Molson, in turn up the Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't help myself. But that moose looks more attractive every day. Um, all righty then. Before we talk about what Bernie Sanders is going to be doing with himself next, let's get into the events of today in our segment, My Witness News. Dave Hines, please fill us in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Russia is spending $200,000 on high-tech biomedical procedures to keep Vladimir Lenin's corpse looking lifelike. Oh. You know, I I would never push uh, 
I would never push Funkhauser's mannerisms on you. I'm happy to have you here. You're doing a killer job. This has been a real treat. I've been looking forward to being in the studio with mm-hmm. Dave Hines ever since I found out you were coming in. However, yes. you being a guy that does cartoon voices, uh-huh. whenever news comes from anywhere out of Eastern Europe, Funkhauser always reads it in, in a Russian accent. So could you try that again? All right, let's try one more time. <clears throat> I don't know how good my Russian is, but... Uh, it's okay. His isn't Russia, good, but it's... Russia is spending $200,000 on high-tech biomedical procedures to keep Vladimir Lenin's corpse looking lifelike. Ah, very good. Huh? Just think moose and squirrel. Moose and squirrel. <laughs> uh, you keep talking. Th- you, tell, you tell joke now, I.D. I think that... Um, <laughs> Wait, No. <laughs> You're Hold on, let me back. derail the entire show real quick. Yeah, you're, you're I, peeling back the curtain by letting people know that our so-called news is just an elaborate setup punchline situation for bad jokes. It's not oh, that. No. no. I think I think people might have figured that out. So uh, we'll continue with transparency. So yeah, Russia is spending two hundred grand on uh, high-tech biomedical procedures to keep Vladimir Lenin's corpse looking like it's still alive. Um, same ones that I think they use on uh, Pat Sajak and Ryan Seacrest <laughs> at the stage in the game. <laughs> Whew. Pat does look why like would the you same. do that? But, but hold up! But why would you do that? Why? 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 Just why would you do that? I could see like, during the Soviet Union because that was you know the the father of communism there or their brand. Um, but mm-hmm. it, now it seems just weird. Maybe it's like if you know if a statue were starting to deteriorate, we would do things to make it look better. But I yeah, guess that's that, that's ooh. creepy to have a corpse on display. Um, yeah, for that amount of time. Anyways, uh, yeah, no, Pat Sajak. Who, who the hell knows what's going on with that guy? I feel bad for Pat Sajak. I mean, not really, because he has the easiest job in the world, and he's probably made untold gazillions of dollars of it off of it. But do you remember, like, maybe a year or two ago, Pat Sajak tweeted out something that was vaguely political, and everyone was like, hey, 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 stay in your lane. It was just like, right. this guy's been around. He's seen a lot. Uh, maybe he's not going to be invited to sit down at the Algon- Algonquin Roundtable anytime super soon. He's not you know, part of any particular access of power in governmental speak, but he's been around. He's got a right to express himself, but people just killed him for having any kind of an opinion politically. It's just like, hey, it's his opinion. He's entitled to it. He's bad Sajak. He should have people spin wheels and yeah. Ugh. But like, have you seen have you seen that show recently? I honestly, I haven't watched Wheel of Fortune in a while. I just remember the episode of Brickleberry recently where uh, one of the characters was fascinated with Pat Sajak. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's 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 they are so clearly going through the motions. And like what what I think is really cool is is Vanna White because you know yeah. I, I think that it's a testament to man, just people like her, people like her because she was hired to be a piece of ass on the show. And I don't know, she's uh, it's not like she's not attractive, but uh, the way Hollywood chews females up and spits them out, mm-hmm. and the way they go, okay, so uh, the leading man is. 43, that means his love interest can be no older than 19. Like, the way Hollywood does that, um, the, the staying power that she's exhibited just by being so charming as she turns letters is really, really something. So, I don't know. I kind of have this uh, weird level of respect for Pat Sajak and especially Vanna White. Yeah. And they've, uh, they, they've, uh, they've lasted in a way that, besides being... <laughs> Uh, yeah. Besides, uh, besides, uh, it. Um, besides the way they've lasted, I, I can get there today. <laughs> besides the way they've lasted, uh, making inspiring a certain amount of morbid curiosity, it, it's also kind of admirable as well. Yeah. Oh, good. We should probably move right along. So researchers say bed bugs have evolved to have thicker skin. Yeah. Like I wasn't living in New York at the time, but there was like a bed bug bed bug epidemic. You know, like, and I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think that was a thing. Like, yeah, sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. and if you did have bed bugs, I thought you could just, you know, get a new mattress or kill it with fire or steam clean your stuff and you'd be all good. But it was like this unstoppable epidemic in New York City. It was gross. And it turns out that the reason bed bugs are so resilient is that they've evolved, like, like you said, to have thicker skin, which makes them more resistant to stuff. Their thick skin. You can give bed bugs critical notes on their screenplay and totally <laughs> cool with it. Yes. <clears throat> Go 
on, people are, bed bugs are sensitive. It's sad. Um, <laughs> Future says his ex girlfriend Sierra is uh, her career is flopping. Yeah, S- Sierra, Sierra, C- I yeah. think it's Sierra. I think she's from Long Island, not far from. Like I lived in Long Island for yeah. for a little bit, and uh, I, I seem to remember. Was it? Glen Cove or something like that, home of Ciara. I think that's who it was. I- I'm not sure, but um, I-, I wasn't aware that she still had something that you could call a career. But uh, Future says his ex girlfriend Ciara's career not so much doing so well anymore. It's flopping. He missed a golden opportunity, though. What? Like, well, I mean, if Future says, "Hey, my ex girlfriend Ciara's career is flopping," he. <laughs> He missed out on the zing of all time. He could have been like, yeah. You know why? You got no future. Ha! Ah! Deal. Ah! Deal with it. Mm-hmm. But he didn't. Which, uh, if you, if you, if your bread and butter is wordplay, as it is with a rapper, I can't believe that he left that one alone. Go figure. Go on. Okay, so this sounds like an old headline, but it's actually new. New photos reveal Jonah Hill has lost a significant amount of weight. Mm. Well, you know. If the past is any indication, I'm sure he's going to keep it off forever. <laughs> he's in a tough spot, man. He is in a tough spot because, like, people don't like when he when he trimmed down. People didn't like the uh, people didn't like the lean, mean Jonah Hill. They they wanted him to be uncomfortable. They're like, you're not as funny if you're not waddling and sweating. It's an interesting one. It's kind of like Chris Farley is hilarious, but would he have been as hilarious if he was ripped, toned, shredded, super athlete with single digit body fat that was able to slice through life's problems like a hot knife through butter? No, he's funnier as the butter. And um, it, it's a weird paradox that a lot of these folks find themselves in. Mm-hmm. I've got a really good friend, really good friend who's uh, actually sat in on this show, a guy called Randall Reeder, who... Um, is huge. He used to be, he, he was in Deadpool and he used to be a professional wrestler. And when you're, I don't know, six foot seven or whatever he is and mm-hmm. built like a tank, um, that, that involves a certain amount of wear and tear that you put on your body, your your joints, your back, stuff like that. Especially if yeah. you spent uh, any t- type of your career jumping off things onto hard surfaces as he did when he was wrestling. And um, it's funny, he said, I got to lose some weight. And you look at him, he doesn't look fat. But, you know, he's carrying, he was like, dude, on me, like, you know, a couple of extra inches, it's a significant amount of weight to be carrying around. It's like, if I lose two inches off my waistline, it's like putting down three backpacks. And I was just like, I never, never thought of it that way. Yeah. And, uh, and he was like, it makes me so mad because people go, don't lose weight. Are, are you worried that you won't be the same guy? And it, it's an interesting one because he legitimately would like to, you know lose weight he's not fat but it would definitely reduce the wear and tear on his body and help him in any number of ways if he were to drop a few pounds but um every time he does that you know people in the in the movie industry is like you sure you want to do that i mean you're this character this is who you are if you get skinny what then and he's just like sure yeah you want me to be a cripple that eventually dies right thank you thank you very much for that time to hire myself a new agent anyways We will discuss what's going on with Bernie Sanders next. Thank you so much for hanging out. Thank you for being a part of our radio family. Someone who everybody wants to punch in the face. A.D. on the radio. So, realistically, Bernie Sanders, who nobody really expected to be around at this stage in the game, can't afford any losses, certainly not in New York. So the situation there throws his whole whole shtick as a potential president into question. You know, I was thinking, though, I was thinking that if Bernie Sanders winds up snagging the Democratic nomination, which a lot of people are finding to be significantly less likely as every day goes by, but if he does, 
and he winds up taking on Donald Trump for president of these United States of America. That is like the most New York City centric thing ever. Both of these guys are from New York. It'll be like Seinfeld. It'll be like an episode of Seinfeld, where it's just like this seems so unrelatable to the rest of the country. Yet it affects absolutely everything. I don't know. I like as much as I love New York, as much as I'm proud to call it my home, I don't know that uh, the only options being New Yorkers is really all that great of a move because there's a whole lot of America that is not New York. Yes, it absolutely 100 percent affects everything. New York touches everything, not just in America, but all over the world. Some people call it the capital of the civilized world. And I don't know if that's the case, but as much as I would like to say that it's not true, there's a certain amount of short-sightedness that New Yorkers display when uh, thinking about what it must, must be like to live in other parts of the country. Just because you cannot, cannot relate to, well, Dave Hines, where are you from? I am from Springfield, Missouri. Okay. Now, as a city, how, how big or small is that? About, about half a million people right. around the area. Not big. Lot, lots of lots of land spaces between houses. Once you get outside the city limits, plenty. Yeah, yeah. very rural outside of that area, um, outside of Springfield. Stuff for kids to do other than hang out and books a million and a Walmart, play baseball when you're yeah, basketball. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. sports and stuff like that. But as far as I don't know, not not like I think there are in the cities. Yeah. No, I mean, and look, you know, uh, by the same token. Space is, of course, comes at an incredibly high premium in uh, in New York City. So are there that many baseball diamonds for high school kids to play on like there are going to be in a town like Springfield, Missouri? And what I'm getting at is not that, you know, baseball is more or less significant depending on where you go in the country. What I'm getting at is the fact that the headspace is an incredibly different one. And you can try to empathize. You can try and wash that out. But I'm a New Yorker. That doesn't wash out. A buddy of mine recently got a gig working for Amazon. Congratulations, Rich, um, if you happen to be listening. He's going to curate all of Amazon. Mm, That's awesome. Yeah, it's an awesome gig. And he was in New York City doing music programming. He's a kid from Queens who's lived in New York City or Jersey or someplace like that his entire life. And he's just like, I don't know, man. I I don't know if I can... You know, and, and Seattle's not like a podunk town or anything like that. Seattle's a metropolitan city. It's, yeah. a, it's a place with a lot of stuff going on. I, I think, you know, it's the 13th largest city or something like that in yeah. America. So it's not small potatoes or anything. But he was like, I don't know, man. I've just, I'm a New Yorker. And I was like, here's the thing. It doesn't matter. Because I can tell you confidently, having not been living in New York for a while now, that doesn't wash out. And it's right. not just some sort of thing where you wear it like a badge and go, I'm tough, I'm from New York. It's a thing where you go, it just it just doesn't come out of your mentality. Even if you wanted it to, it would not. So it's an interesting one having like two guys that are poised to be president of America, both hailing directly from New York City. Which, man, I know Sanders has spent time in Vermont. Which, by the way, one thing that I'm surprised about, like yeah, Vermont, essentially drug capital of America, you know, like and I don't think people really call him on that. Have, have you ever seen anyone take him to task over that? Like, hey, you know, that place you're supposed to be in charge of got some serious problems, my friend. What do you intend to do about it or what have you done about it? I haven't heard that enter into the conversation. I haven't paid as close attention to the Democratic debates just because, well, They're not as ridiculously interesting and hilarious. No one is going to insult someone else's junk size or say that a moderator is (laughs) having their period uh, during the Democratic debates equals A.D. Nawachi. So I I don't know. Has has anyone really taken him to task over that stuff? Not that I know of. Mm. Mm. Hmm. Interesting. But the fact remains that if you told me this time last year that Bernie Sanders, which is funny because, like, I... I, uh, not a lot of people knew who he was uh, up until super recently, you know, last couple of years. But I'd come across him a couple times before. And the way SNL did it, I was like, this guy's totally Larry David. This guy's straight from an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. And uh, apparently I wasn't the only one that noticed. But if you told me a year or two ago that Bernie Sanders would still be up in the game all the way through New York in terms of the Democratic primary race, 
I would have said, <laughs> yeah, next thing you're going to tell me is that people are going to take Trump seriously this time. Oh, snap. So all bets are off. But um, here's the thing. This was a state that he needed to win. He needed to win. He needs to win absolutely everything he can. He is, without a shadow of a doubt, the underdog, the dark horse. I think he started off with, hold on, let me check this article in the New York Times that I was reading. He, he entered uh, the race with a deficit of around 200 pledged delegates. Delegates awarded based on the results of primaries and caucuses, not the superdelegates. He, mm-hmm. he needed 57% of the remaining pledged delegates to emerge with a majority by convention, which didn't seem like much, but it's a huge number. Because Democrats award their delegates purport, uh, delegates <laughs> delegates uh-huh. <laughs> sounds uh-huh. like we're talking about washing underwear. Uh, Democrats award their delegates proportionally in each primary. He needed to win the rest of the race by a margin of about fifty-seven to forty-three, mm-hmm. um, and he wound up losing by about fifty-seven to forty-three. Mm-hmm. So, and uh, even I think even if all of the seventeen contests that he won got to vote again if uh, if they counted twice he would still be behind Hillary Clinton in the pledge delegate count so mm. i don't know a lot of people are saying he's done so but there's something about a guy like him i think ted cruz has this too there's something about tenacity there's something about going f what you think i'm going to keep going and I think one thing that's interesting about the presidential race, everyone always just thought it was straight up Hillary all the way. Yet, here are all these dark horses, whether you love them or loathe them, whether you think Sanders is a commie that needs to go away, whether you think Trump is a Nazi that needs to go away, whether you think Ted Cruz is an ideological wingnut that needs to go back to small town Texas, they're all still there and they're all still swinging. And there's a lesson for that and a lesson in that for all of us. Once again, AD on the radio. So, I can't remember where it wore off. I remember the first time I was ever sent on a business trip. Like, when I was a guy in a band, like, that was my job. I had to travel around trains, planes, automobiles. Uh, when our tour bus broke down the back of some list, uh, some uh, some fan station wagon to get us to the next gig, and, like our tour manager was like, "Just th- th- I'll get a U-Haul. You pile in. They promise to drive you." Like, Do you know this person? No. Do you know what their driving record is? Any idea if they're sober? No. They're just a really big fan. Well, that's creepy. I guess we'll just be in the car with them for the next ooh, oh, oh, 11 hours as we make our way from Dallas to Detroit. Fantastic. Great. Wonderful. Um, like oh. traveling used to be my bread and butter. But then when I got into radio, when I got into radio, I was like, radio involves a lot of, you stay here. Like, you've got to be here in the studio every single day, 365 days a year. We can give you mm, half a day off on Christmas Eve. Cool. Deal with it. You get to make fart jokes on the air and we pay you vaguely enough to cover your bills. So take the rough with the smooth, bitch, was the attitude toward uh, travel that I used to get when I first started in radio. Mm -hmm. And then there was a moment where... I had my first business trip. Mm. They're like, we would like you to, uh, I was in Texas at the time, and they're like, we would like to fly you to New York City so you can take part in this convention and do a live broadcast and be part of the iHeartRadio Theater. And blah, blah. I was like, ooh, fancy. Mm-hmm. And that was like a few years back. And I, I, I felt like I had arrived. I was a business traveler. Like I'd been a mm-hmm. schlub and a band traveler, but I'd never been a business traveler before. And that was like new and exciting. And I'm trying to pinpoint the time when the excitement to travel for business wore off and it just got to be like, oh God, my knees are going to hurt. All right. I've got my neck pillow. Yeah, I know it's not cool, but um, it legitimately helps me be vaguely comfortable on a plane. This 
sucks. This really sucks. Can they? No, no, I don't think I need to go to that. Are you sure you can't find somebody else to do it? I, I would like to stay home. I hate traveling for work. Sucks. Just absolutely sucks. I don't like the work that has to go into finishing up at the office before you can go away for a couple of days to go work somewhere else. And it's yeah. just not for me. I, I am over it. But one thing that never fails to bemuse me when I'm in the airport doing that seasoned business travel thing that I find myself doing more than I would like to do these days is I listen to the music. I listen to the music and I go, huh, huh, what the hell is this? Somebody got paid to put this on the radio. I, I don't understand it. Interesting. And, uh, or, or not the radio, but the, the PA, <laughs> as uh, evidenced by Brian Regan. I like music, man. That's why I like to go to the airport early, you know? <laughs> I always play great music. I always have unbelievable sound systems. You get there early, you take advantage of that. You just jam to the best music known to man. <laughs> Occasionally there's an announcement, but other than that, you're just getting into the music, you know. Yesterday, all my... Tr Would the gentleman who left a briefcase at the secured area of Concourse C please return to claim your briefcase? And it seems like all unattended vehicles will be towed away at the owner's expense. Oh, I believe there's been a gate change for flight 207. It'll now be departing out of gate 19. Yesterday. I love that song. <laughs> Takes my mind off traveling. A brief reprieve from the awfulness that is business travel. Mm. All righty then. So um, it being 420, Dave Hines, you still have yet to share your, uh, your favorite recipe. Well, you know, I'm one of those people that... Um... Man, I'm trying to think of some of the the better things that I've I found things that can be done with burgers. Uh, oh. But you you mentioned something with old white bread, and this doesn't this isn't really a this isn't necessarily a 420 thing, but it's something that I remember from my youth, and and I would enjoy a lot. Speaking of like just the cheap white bread, mayo and bacon. So basically, a bacon, lettuce, and tomato without the uh, L and and T. Mm. And it's really mayo good. And mm. Yeah. That's just mm -hmm. the way it's supposed to be done. So a BLT removing any form of nutrition, fiber, or something exactly. that could uh, prolong as opposed to end your life early. Here's my thing about lettuce and tomato on sandwiches. I don't like hot, greasy vegetables, and that's what happens when you put them on up against grilled meat, like burgers mm. or bacon or things like mm. that. That's, that's just my opinion. That's one man's opinion. Mm. Mm. I did like for whatever reason when I was uh, when I, when I partook in that kind of thing, mm -hmm. I, I just anything hot, you know, like I, I didn't mind warm, like warm cookies or, right. or something of that nature. That wasn't uh, that that wasn't something that wow. um, I, I could deal with. I, I liked anything that was cool because like interesting, you you wound up sort of feeling like. I don't know. You had cotton mouth, and I, I just liked anything that was cool and soothing on your throat. Huh. But uh, yeah, today is. Uh, can you know what? Can we play some appropriate 420 music? Are, are you able to uh, uh, dial on, some of that in? Something here. Have a look. I'll talk. We'll today, today's 420 day. The unofficial holiday of marijuana enthusiasts. Uh, some people are a little too enthusiastic about smoking said reefer, which is uh, why I thought we would discuss some of the reasons why. Uh, some of the reasons why you should quit smoking pot. You should you should probably quit smoking pot because, well, it leaves more for Dave Hines. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should probably quit smoking pot because you recently spent an entire afternoon looking for a miniature universe on your left nipple. Have you uh, spent uh, <laughs> Have you spent some time uh, considering parts of your body when you've been stoned, Dave Hines? I've thought about things a lot. I'll be right. My, it's funny. I think maybe having come across it as an adult makes me different because it's like, okay, you need to come out of this with something. Be productive right now. So yeah. I'll be like, I'm going to set out to think about this thing. Yeah. <laughs> How, how do I? Uh, and then I forget. Ever, That's what I, right. you know, the point. I was like, how does that work out for you in the in the end? Like, if gonna, you notice that long, take a, that long mm -hmm. silence, that was me thinking about it. Usually, sometimes I will think of things that I want to do, and then but I don't do them. But I write them down to think like, hey, should I have done this? Would that have been yeah. a good idea or a bad idea? 
and and I think like okay, I probably would have done this, but I I just chose not to at the last minute. And I go back and check, and so I keep those in my phone, and I just think about them. Sometimes they're funny. Mm. That's all. Um, there you go. You know the things that I wanted to say at, to my neighbors. Um, one time I wanted to do a Periscope video of me just sitting at the piano playing the theme song from Different Strokes over and over. <laughs> Because I thought people just needed to chill out and get along, and I thought the theme song from Different Strokes was a good way to do that. <laughs> you, you realize you just said theme song. <laughs> theme song. I'm, theme song. I'm, I'm, well, so I was going to do a bluegrass version of it. Uh, theme song. <laughs> uh, another reason you might want to stop smoking pot is it'd be good to see at this stage in the game if you're still a Bernie Sanders supporter ah! without it. <laughs> and let's be real here. No one your age should still watch that much spongebob oh yes do you find yourself doing stupid mindless immature things when you have uh, partaken in your medicine sometimes in the state of california uh, sometimes i'm probably i'm probably a little more responsible but i have friends who do a lot of interesting things and i do find it fascinating the amount of entertainment that is made just for people in that state like mm. how much how much tv and animation and you know i do some cartoon voices and things like that and so uh, being stone cold sober on the side of making that stuff when the the guys have already smoked a whole bunch or done whatever and they wrote those scripts and then I'm uh-huh. sitting there doing these inside jokes on on cartoons and things like that and I don't always get them and I wonder right. like I wonder if I was high right now if I would think this was funny or if I just would have needed to be there right I remember a guy in a band once told me he was like really yeah because like, this is a band that we toured with. And um, I was, I was like, "Yeah, you good show." He was like, disappointed that I wasn't absolutely blown away by his band's performance. And he's like, "See, I don't know if you're ever really gonna get us." So I was like, well, "Why not?" He's like, "Cause you don't, you don't, yeah, you, you need to watch us while you're on ecstasy." I was just like, oh. "Doesn't ecstasy make absolutely everything seem great? Like, right. literally, it could be like sounds of a cat getting <laughs> strangled." And you could drop a hit of that stuff and think it was the single greatest piece of art that had ever been produced by man or beast or the combination thereof. Another reason that you uh, might want to stop smoking pot, <clears throat> mm-hmm. making the other air traffic controllers a little nervous. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, finally, finally, the last reason you might want to st- stop smoking pot is even Willie Nelson and Woody Harrelson seem to think that you have some sort of a problem. <laughs> So I believe, I believe, if I'm not very much mistaken, this is one of those things that we've known about for a little while. And uh, Funkhauser and I were like, can we talk about it yet? Because it's exciting stuff. Mm -hmm. Has it been confirmed? Is it penciled in? Is it inked in? Where are we at with all this? Um, And uh, it turns out that uh, there's a reasonably good chance that in early May, we will be joined on the show by... None other than Jim Brewer. Having an SNL guy come and sit in on the show oh, is going to be yes. absolutely fantastic. He's got a comedy metal album that is great and hilarious that you should do yourself a favor and check out. And, like, I don't know if Funk, Funkhauser would uh, slap my wrist for mentioning it on the show at this stage in the game. But I think, I think uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm walking this back just enough so that if he doesn't show up, I don't look completely stupid. I think that Jim Brewer is going to be sitting in on the show in early May. And we're going to have all sorts of things to talk about. We're going to be able to talk about uh, the New York Mets. We're going to be able to talk about the, what it was like to be uh, on SNL. We're going to be I'm, – I'm so unbelievably excited for this one. Uh, I can taste it. But yes. he happens to be very, very good friends with – Brian Johnson of ACDC. He mm. does, uh, well, not so much mm-hmm. of ACDC anymore. He does a killer impersonation of Brian Johnson. Mm-hmm. Does a killer impersonation of him. And I guess that's how they became friends. Like, he's really kind of in with a lot of the metal community and the rock community. And um, it was actually something on his blog or his podcast that set the set the rumor mill working overtime with regard to the future of ACDC with Brian Johnson. And uh, hopefully... Hopefully, he'll be willing to talk about that a little bit when he comes on the show because he definitely has the inside story on one of the biggest happenings in rock for a very long time. Brian Johnson has commented for the first time since ACDC replaced him with Axl Rose, but he didn't stir up any drama. He just clarified his own situation. He said that he risked total deafness if he kept performing 
at large venues where the sound levels are beyond his current tolerance, and he didn't have a choice but to leave the tour. He went on the record saying he's not retiring, saying, quote, my doctors have told me that I can continue to record in studios, and I intend to do that. I'm hoping that in time my hearing will improve and allow me to return to live concert performances. Only time will tell. And you know what's very interesting? Dave Hines, mm-hmm. who is sitting in for Funkhauser this week, is not only a vet, uh, not only a veteran, but a multi-instrumentalist. You play pretty much every instrument under the sun, right? Right. That's just because I need to eat. Right. You know. <laughs> but but, but yes. here's the thing that a lot, a lot of people don't realize about working musicians you develop, you know, look at a drummer. Drummers get arthritis. You Absolutely. Know, you think of the amount of time and, and amount of time they spend moving their elbows and their wrists around that other people don't. It's mm-hmm. kind of crazy. But yeah. Um, so, yeah, Brian Johnson has some specific health concerns. He said, my doctors have told me I can continue to record in the studios and I intend to do that. I'm hoping that in time my hearing will improve and allow me to return to live concert performances. Only time will tell. Mm. We hope they do. Me too. Happy 420, everybody. All right. Cool, man. Nice show. Thank you. You as well. Oh, thanks. Hope I didn't derail things there during the news. I was just like, oh, no, it's totally cool. A- I mean, like, I, I like it to be a jumping off point. It actually gets kind of dull if it doesn't develop into conversation a couple times during it. So yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Let's see. 